Welcome to the Happy Lawyer Project. I'm your host, Akoma Moronu, and I created the show to help lawyers find happiness in life with a law degree. And together with my guests, we'll provide the knowledge, skills, insight, inspiration, and encouragement you need to find your happy. Hello there, lawyers. So I'm super excited to have you guys back. And just as a reminder for all of those of you who did not hear last week's episode, this month I am diving into a bunch of listeners' questions to catch up on different questions that I've been receiving over the months. And then we will get back to interviews in early January. So if you love to hear me just ramble on answering questions, please stick around. And if you're here for the interviews, then join us back in January. So today we will be chatting. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me introduce Dave. Mr. Happy Lawyer Project is here with me today to help keep me on track and make sure and keep me honest. Let's be honest. What's up, everyone? Excited to talk about money. Yes. So today we will be answering some money questions. I get a lot of these questions and I wanted to put them into one episode because I know not everybody's super interested in hearing about money. And it's one of my favorite topics. And so I just wanted to break it out into its own episode for people who have an interest. I also wanted to remind people that on episode 94, I did a first set of listener questions where I talked about how to set up your financial future. And so it was kind of a basics 101, super straightforward, simple answer. So if you're looking for something a little shorter, a little more direct, then I would head over to episode 94. This one's going to be a little bit longer. I also thought it was really important to tackle this topic because I know that money and student loans is something that keeps a lot of lawyers up at night and it can often become an excuse for people not moving forward on that big project, on that kind of risky career choice. I think people, especially those who've put in so much money into becoming lawyers have a fear of walking away or people who have a lot of loans worry about taking a pay cut and not being able to afford those loans. And so it can be used as that excuse to stay stuck. So I think that it's a really important topic and I wanted to dive into that today. And I'm going to start by chatting a little bit about money personalities. I think we've probably all done personality tests, whether it's Meyer Briggs or what are some of the other ones that people do? The disc profile. Yep. You know, with any of those, it's a indication of the direction that you lean. It's not a black and white answer as to who you are. So we'll dive into that to start, and then we'll go into our money management system so you can understand a little bit about how we use our personalities to create a system, and then we will answer the listener questions. So obviously, I'm not a financial expert. You guys should do your own research. This is just the way I do things and the way I think about things, and I'm hoping that this will help you feel a little bit more comfortable and stir in you kind of the questions you should be asking yourself and be a catalyst for you to do your own research and build your own financial goals and picture. So I think that that's all I got. Yeah, I think we're ready. Let's dive right in and get started with the five financial personality types. Yep. So there are five financial personality types that people typically talk about, and there's different names for them, but they generally fall into five categories. And as I've already said, you know, you could have a little of all of them, but you're going to lean towards more, some more than others. And people typically have a dominant and a secondary. So think about that as you listen to these and also realizing that these are just tendencies. This is kind of your default versus you're all of one and none of any of the rest. So the first one is the spender. And spenders tend to believe that money is meant for spending and they have no problem spending money. They love spending money. The issue with spenders at times can be that they will spend more than they have. And they tend to think that the purpose of money is for it to be spent. And so they can get themselves into financial trouble. But on the positive side, Spenders tend to be very generous with their money. They give to charity. They give to friends. They're very giving. And that's a wonderful thing about spenders. No one's ever going to call them a miser or feel like they're cheap, which I think is a great thing. Do you think you're much of a spender? I was actually just asking myself that question. I think in general, my default is just don't buy it whenever we talk about anything, which sounds like I'm not a spender, but I love buying other people food. Very specifically, I think one of the ways that I connect with people is around just saying like, I'll just get it. There's a lot to unpack in that. But anyway, uh, no. Yeah, I very much think spender is my second 
I love to spend money. Yeah. I'm very, very, very much a spender, but it's not my dominant personality at all. Okay, so the next one is savers. And savers love, obviously, to save. They love a good deal. You know, they're those people who love to clip coupons because they really get a kick out of it. And it can be really hard to get savers to part with their money. They're kind of the opposite of spenders. And so some of the cons of that is that they can be seen as cheap or they can be seen as miserly. You know, they may be the people who tip exactly 18% down to the penny and you're just watching them at the table as a spender. You're like, just round up. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) It's not that big of a deal. But for the saver, that's going to be really, really important. And this can also, if you're a lawyer who's a saver and has this personality, it can also really make you undervalue your time because sometimes going to that level, you know, clipping coupons or, you know, calculating things to the penny isn't the best use of your skill set and of your time. But savers tend to be very resourceful with their money. They tend to be very creative with their money. They tend to be very lifestyle focused instead of possession focused. And so these are really great things about savers. You know, at the end of the day, they spend money on things that is a, are of value to them when they are really living their best life. So savers are great. I mean, let's be honest, none of them are bad or good. Everybody has their pros and cons. The next one are what are typically called the risk adverse personalities or the security based personalities. And for them, planning is key. Money for them gives them a sense of security. They really like to invest in things that they understand. They do a lot of research before they make big purchases. They view money very much as something that generates security in their life. And while they can be hesitant to part with money, or, you know, want to do a ton, a ton of research before parting with their dollars, they also tend to be very practical with their money. And they tend to be, once they are comfortable, they're okay with spending. And so that's a great thing about this personality. In their best version, they're going to be the one who takes care of the family finances. They're going to be the ones who makes the family plan. But obviously, because they can be so risk averse, there can be a fear of taking on uncertain risk. So they'll put their money in that secure account every day over the, more, the riskier one. And so over their lifetime, they will forego some potential upside because of that risk. Dave is smiling over here because <laughs> this is so clearly my dominant personality. It's why I love talking about money. It's why I love money podcasts. I mean, I listen to like 12 or 15 money podcasts a week. I read tons of money books. And I am getting increasingly comfortable with risk. I think it's interesting because I have that risk averse personality and that spender personality. And so once I've done all my research, I will just spend, I will just, as soon as I'm comfortable, the money's out the door, you know, and it just, and it just gets, it's a challenge for me. And I'm sure it's a challenge for Dave because I will go one second from being like, I don't know if we should do it. I don't know if we should do it to being like, I bought it. (laughs) Yeah, It's already out the door. (laughs) But one thing you didn't mention about that, that maybe it's just you is a bit of information paralysis can come in there as well, which I think works for us because you're just an information get collector. Yep. But I think that that probably has a lot to do with my spender second yeah. habit is that because I want to spend the money at some point I I can move past that information paralysis. But for if you were a risk averse saver, that yeah. would be more of a challenge. So the next one are gamblers. Gamblers are the opposite of the risk averse security. They love to spend money on potential. You know, they love the thrill of the chase of building wealth. They're the serial entrepreneurs, the people who would work to make more money, even if they had all the money in the world, because they really enjoy the game. They enjoy the process. You know, I think that the term gambler is very, can almost seem negative. I, it's one of those things that if they're good at it and if they're profitable, you know, we look at them and we think, wow, they're really willing to take risk. That's such a positive attribute. You know, it's those entrepreneurs who put everything on the line and then build a million dollar business in a year. And we're like, oh my gosh. Likewise, if they're the person sitting at the casino, who's like just one more game, just one more game, we think of that as very negative. And so there's definitely a balance that needs to be struck with this personality. As with all of them, there's a lot of upside, but there can be downside if it's not managed and recognized. 
neither of us, I think, are gamblers. So it's not one that resonates strongly in our household. But I have, you know, lots of my entrepreneur friends who I admire their ability to kind of put it all on the line. It's just not in my personality. And the last one are called the flyers or the free spirits. And they just don't pay attention. They don't think about money. It's not something that concerns them. You're almost certainly not a flyer if you're this far into the podcast. (laughs) You probably didn't click on it in the first instance. And then when you heard it, what it was about, you probably... Hit pause. Yep. Didn't get this far into the podcast. But some of you may be flyers as your secondary. So you may be someone who likes to spend, but otherwise doesn't think about it or who likes to plan, but otherwise, once you have your plan, you put your plan in place and otherwise you don't think about it. They, you know, flyers can sometimes be seen as very immature in their money sensibilities because they don't care. They don't know and they don't care to know. And they would be equally happy with a small amount of money in their bank account as a huge amount of money in their bank account. As long as they have enough money to make pay the bills at the end of the day, they're fine. And they can often think that people such as the savers or the risk averse who put a lot of thought into their money are a bit obsessive and they they would never want to be like that. And so, you know, if you've ever been around somebody who's overly obsessive about money, someone like a flyer could be a breath of fresh air because they're just so content. They can be so content with just what they have, which is a wonderful quality. This is definitely me in some stretch. And I like that you've put a positive, like pointed out the positive and the challenges to overcome with each because I think of this as an aspect of my personality to overcome. Like I was already thinking of tips about how you've helped me get through that, but it's true. They just are happy to let it flow. Oh yeah. Dave doesn't think about money ever. (laughs) So that's why I wanted to dive into our management system because obviously I am both the person who does the planning and the person who does the spending. And meanwhile, Dave, it was up to him, you know, money would just be in his bank account. He would pay for the things he needs and once in a while, he'd buy stuff he wants, and it would just kind of flow more organically, I think. Yes. And to your point about how you listen to 20 podcasts a week, I think the nature of the podcast has made it much more appealing as a topic to me that I think about and like to talk about to other people about. So I'm a little bit shifting on that spectrum. So let's, yeah, let's get back into what you were mentioning about our money management system, which I love. So it took us some time to get to the system we have today, but we've had it for probably four years now. And it's based primarily on our money personalities, me as the planner and Dave as the fly-by-night money (laughs) enthusiast. (laughs) And then we layer on top of that. So the system is based on our personalities and then the priorities and goals are based on our values. And so at a high level, what we do each month or kind of bi-weekly as um, our paychecks come in is first we pay our bills, then we put money towards our saving goals, and then we spend the rest. So because I'm a planner, that works for me. And because I'm a spender, that works for me. Because if I had a budget that told me I can only spend $100 on food every month, I would always spend more. Because I I really hate the constraints of a budget. A budget would never, ever work for me. A budget would work much more for Dave he would just like, if I gave him a budget, he would just do it. He wouldn't create a budget unless I asked him to, but it's not, but it's unnecessary because the system works so much better for us. So the way it works is we have weekly meetings where we touch base on our, on money. Really. I do a review. I check our money, you know, constantly. I check it daily. And so once a week at our Sunday meetings, I'll give them an update on status and any changes to our spending or goals or any big expenses that are coming up. And then at our quarterly meetings, which we discussed in detail on the last podcast, we'll dive into deeper detail about that and realign bigger picture goals. And then yearly, we'll do an even bigger deep dive and do reallocations and stuff like that. But in order for a system like ours to work, which I call the anti-budgeting system, you have to have clarity around what your fixed costs are. And you have to know that after you pay all your bills, there's going to be money left over. So the first thing to do to set up an anti-budget would be to track your spending and to know what am I spending on that I have to spend on every month? What am I spending on every month that I could cut if I needed to? And what what's my disposable income after all that? And then you also have to have clarity around what your goals and priority of those goals are because 
as everyone knows, we all have conflicting financial goals and it can be really, really hard to know which ones to put money towards. So you need to know what your key financial goals are. And I would suggest for most people who are starting on something like this, you would only have two or three so that it's easy to prioritize and it's easy to manage and to distribute the funds appropriately. Once you get, I mean, we have, you know, half a dozen to two dozen at any given point, but we've been doing this for five years now. And so that we built them in one by one. We didn't start with this many. Maybe it would be useful for you to share what our key goals are right now and how, maybe how we got to them. Yeah. So our key goals, I would say right now are what we call financial independence, what other people might call retirement. That just means getting to the point where we have enough money that we wouldn't have to work. Another key goal, which we call our island fund, which for a lot of other people, I think would be buying a house. You've heard me say this before. One of my really ridiculous goals is to buy an island. And another goal of ours is real estate investment. And so I think for other people, this would be college funds for their kids. But we've decided that we think that we'd prefer to do it through real estate because it gives us a little bit more flexibility. And the way that works is you buy properties that are paid off in full by the time your kids are in college. And so if you need to refinance money out of those houses, you could pull equity out to pay for college or kids can just live off of the cash flow from the rentals. And so that's kind of something we, that's the path we've decided to take based on our values. And one of our values is very much flexibility. And the real estate option, I think, gives us more flexibility because we personally have conflicting feelings about the future of college, where we'll be living at that point in our lives. And so something like a traditional 529 account, college savings account may not work for our kids. So that's the path that we've taken. And so when the money comes in, you know, we have clear amounts that go towards each of those goals. We have clear timelines for reaching those goals. And, you know, as you probably know, if you have the two things you can change for achieving a goal is the timeline and the quantity. So if you have three goals, what you need to do is figure out how much money you could put towards each. And then based on that, knowing how much money you'll need, it'll tell you what your timeline is, or you can do it the other way around and say, I want a house in three years. I need $250,000 for that house. So in order to save that, I'd have to save X each month. And so you could play around with the numbers to get them to a place where you feel comfortable and you feel like your money's being contributed to the things that you value in the proportion that you value them to achieve that goal. And then because you know that you're on track, as long as you make those payments, you're on track to hit your goal at the time you want to hit it, then everything else you can spend. And for the savers, that's going to be hard. The savers are going to want to save all the way to that last dollar. But for me as a spender, that's not a problem. (laughs) And so we very much automate that once we have that figured out so that when our paychecks come in each month, first thing that goes out of the paychecks are bills. Next thing that goes out of the paychecks are savings. So then everything left in our bank account, like 24 hours after we get paid is for me to play around with. That's right. Yeah. So I think that that's the basics of our money management system. I can go into way more detail, but I think I've probably lost a lot of you already. So I want to get to our listener questions. Awesome. It's a great system, everyone. You should check it out. Jumping into the questions, these are kind of a group of questions that go together. So how much money should I have in my emergency fund? If paying off my student loans is my priority, should I focus on that before I build up my emergency fund? So this is a really good question. I, again, because I tend to be a little bit more risk averse, we have an emergency fund of six times our monthly expenses. And that's that fixed cost number that I was talking about before. And we have enough money to cover us for six months in the event that we were to both lose our jobs and not be able to find a job. And obviously, people say you should have as much as a year to 18 months. People say you can get by with as little as one month. And that really, really depends on your sources of income, kind of your job prospects, your own personality. Like, are you somebody, if you lost your job and there were no job prospects, you would be comfortable working at Starbucks until you figured something out? Do you have a partner or spouse who works that could help keep you afloat? You know, all of these things. Because if you have two incomes, I think then the likelihood that you both lose your jobs, unless you're both in the same industry or working, you you know, at the same company, then that provides some security and diversification. And so 
how much money you should have in your emergency fund will depend on your comfort level. I would say that at a bare minimum, you should have three months of fixed costs. And I would say you shouldn't have more than a year unless you and your partner or you alone are the sole breadwinner of a business you own. Because if you own your business and you both work in your business, there's a great potential for return on investment, but there's also the potential that something happens in the market or in the industry that causes a bad year. And then it would just be whether it's what if you get sick, whether it's a regulation changes that makes it harder for you to run your business. There's just things that could happen that you wouldn't see. And so I would say that you would want to be on the safer side. But because people who tend to start their own businesses are more risk averse than I, <laughs> that may sound like a lot. And then to the student loan question, I would say that even if student loans are your priority, having an emergency fund, which we actually called an opportunity fund, is really important because you never want to get yourself in a situation where a thousand dollars puts you in like severe dire straits. But if you are someone who feels comfortable or confident that your job is fairly secure, that if you had to put, you know, X amount of money on the credit card, you could cover it, you know, that's going to be to your comfort level. But I would say that even if student loans is your priority, you should try to build up an emergency fund in the next year or so of one month, two months, just so that you have that in case you ever do need to walk away from a job or take some time off to help, you know, loved one that's ill or something like that. The next question is pretty exciting or was for us in the context of paying off student loans. How do you handle a windfall such as a year end bonus? I think this is a great question and a great time of year for that question. For us, we put that money into our midterm priorities. As I told you previously, we have a ton of goals and a lot of different buckets for our money, whether it's travel or um, real estate or buying an island. Don't laugh. It's going to happen. And then you guys are all going to be really excited. <laughs> I'm ready. So we think of our short-term goals as things that are immediate, le- you know, in the next couple of years. And for most people, that'll be things like vacations. Maybe it's a new car. Maybe it's putting, you know, paying for your kid's schooling. Those are things you should be saving towards, but there's not, you know, that can just sit in a savings account and it's kind of ongoing. Midterm goals are those five to 15 year goals. And Real estate and the island fund very much sit in those. And for us, student loans very much sat in that for a long time. And then you have those long-term goals. Long-term goals tend to be slow and steady and very much based on taking advantage of time. So those are retirement accounts. Those are college accounts. When you know you have a lot of time, you can just, as long as you keep putting money in at a consistent basis, you'll get to your goal. There's not a huge reason to dump money into it because it's not like I'm going to retire, you know, tomorrow. It's not like I can send my kids to college tomorrow, but if it is a huge priority for you and it's something that keeps you up at night, then perhaps you would switch this around. But that's the way we think about it is when I get a bonus, I say 10% is for us to keep and spend. That's the spender in me. I need to do a little of that. And then the other 90% is split up across our top priorities based on their importance to us. So for the last few years, paying off student loans was the priority. And so we put 100% of the money into that and was able to pay off our student loans, you know, in four years, five years. So that was really important. And that's been great. Gosh, it was the best. And it's fun to share that story with other people because then when their year end comes around and they're thinking about it, they're like, oh, you just paid off all your loans with your bonus. And then they do that and you feel so good for them. Different people feel differently about that. I think that some people, for some people, that's a huge weight on their shoulder. But for other people who have 3% loans and they know that they can make the payment and the payment is $3 a month, it doesn't bother them. And they're happy to just pay it for the 20 years it'll take to pay it. So I definitely try to not project my own enthusiasm (laughs) about not having that weight onto other people. And that's why I really wanted to make the point that you need to figure out what your values are first and then figure out your priorities and then your money will serve that. Next question. Where should I put my savings? I'm saving towards a down payment for a house that we're hoping to buy in the next two or three years. Should I invest that money or keep it in a straight savings account? This is another good question because obviously I've spoken high level that we have all these goals and all these priorities. And I know different people do different things. Some people have like an individual bank account for every goal. And so they have, you know, 11, 12 bank accounts and that's how they like to manage their money. Other people 
kind of know where their money is and manage it on a spreadsheet. Other people don't manage it at all and are fine with that. So I would say that if your goal is to put a down payment on a house in the next two or three years, that money would go in a savings account. Any goal that's less than five years out should not be invested. For those of you who follow the market at all, you know that things have been a little tumultuous the last few months, and you just never want to get yourself into a position where you want to act on that goal and you're unable to because you're you're hostage to the market conditions. Because that if you get to the point two or three years from now where you find that perfect house, you're at that perfect stage in your life where you want to move into your home and the market is at an all-time low, are you going to be okay with waiting? Are you going to be okay with pushing it back by six months, a year, 18 months until you've regained enough money to buy the house you want? Or are you going to regret having put it in the market? And I think for my money, I would say it should be in a savings account because that's going to be the place that's going to give you the most security that you can act on that goal at the time that you want to. And so a good place to check out savings accounts is magnifymoney.com. They'll show you kind of the best interest rates and accounts for your money, best savings accounts, best high yield savings accounts. At the time of recording, I think 2% interest is pretty standard on an online savings account. So if you're getting anything less than 2% on your savings, you're losing money and you're leaving money on the table. I personally use Ally, SoFi, and Barclays to save our money. And we do separate some of it out because I find that it helps me visualize the money better to know that you know, this account is for the kids' schooling, this amount is for vacation, this amount is for our opportunity fund. But you know, obviously those are the ones I use. Doesn't mean you should use them. You should do some research. I think they're great. The services are great. It's easy to get the money in and out, but they're not brick and mortar banks. So I'm less likely to like drive by one and be like, let's get some cash out, you know? And I think that for me, that creates, that helps to manage my spender personality. All right. That was great. There's so much more we could talk about. It's such a testament to your influence that I'm so excited and was like, ready to ask you 10 more questions. Yeah, I think that is all we have for today. We didn't want to go on too long about money, but I really appreciate you guys listening. And I just wanted to give you a heads up that I am considering running a very informal money book club in the new year. So we would spend a month reading a book and then a month implementing things we learned from the book. And so we would read six books over the course of the year. It's something I'm doing with the women in my family, some of the men as well, but I think the women seem a little bit more excited. And I was considering offering it to my audience as well. So if you guys are interested in that, if that's something you think that you'd want to join along on, then please send me an email or DM me on Instagram. Just let me know that you're interested and I will push it out to the group as well in a more organized manner. Otherwise, I will just give you guys updates along the way. Thanks so much. And until next time. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the holidays. Thanks for listening.